that image of my identity is what dictates my actions and my behavior. So if anything tampers with that sense of self, it's going to affect my motivation, my pursuit in life, and ultimately it's also going to affect my, my mental resilience to cope with the stress of life. It's liberating at the end of the day, you know? Because we, we are saying, why are we confused now? Why are we not able to live life the way we are supposed to live? It's because we are confused. Because imagine a, a simple idea like understanding that there is a balance between knowing that your life depends on how you relate to other life, nature, and everything around you. You will be conscious of how you put your leg because you know that it affects other people. You can't just say, okay, I feel angry today, so everybody must be angry. I just begin to do anything anyhow. No, you can't do that. The message, at least that I tell my students and hope they hear every day uh, in school, I start every semester with this because I also teach uh, at a, in a border region where identity is very important uh, by the border of Mexico and America and so forth. Um, but I always begin by telling people that no matter who you are, where you're from, your skin color, your gender, race, etc., you belong. You belong to this cosmos, you belong to this world. You are loved. You are born of something divine, something much greater and mysterious than any of us can understand. And is it and it is up to you to choose your purpose. for checking out Obehi podcast. We encourage people to own their story and share it with the world to expand their purpose. Before we start this presentation, I have something to quickly share with you. Are you a purpose-driven entrepreneur? I mean, do you want to cut across the noise and attract your ID client by leveraging your own story? Then pay attention. I have a signature program that can help you own your story. A five-step transformative journey to reshape your professional and business narrative for success in less than 90 days. And it's available at academy.aclasses.org slash story. This is what we have understood. Storytelling is the most powerful instrument known to man. And this is what that could mean to you. You can either own your story and use it to advance your purpose in your business and professional life, or someone else will do. The choice is yours. Now let's get started with today's episode of the Obehi podcast. Thank you everyone for joining this uh, interesting conversation. We are going to be talking about uh, identity crisis today as it relates to uh, African people and of course also African diaspora. Uh, if you have been listening to our episode uh, in Obehi podcast, you will understand that we really pay attention to identity and our identity crisis for because of who we are as a people, because of what has happened to us, in the course of our history. It's something that is particularly important for me as a person, and of course, to our demography too. Uh, in fact, I, I have a book on it uh, that I call Identity Crisis, because I believe that many of us, we are actually having this crisis, uh, and which of course, again, is based on what have happened to us. So today, I have the privilege of interviewing uh, two important personalities that are joining us, uh, one from uh, UK, the other one from the US, uh, of course, I've done a number of episodes with them. Of course, if you have been following the Obey podcast, you understand that I've, uh, I have a lot of episodes with each of them. Uh, they are really refined mind. I understand what they do. Uh, what they share with me is uncommon. 
So that is why I decided to uh, put the, this conversation together today so that they will help us to understand the dynamics of the identity crisis that we have within the African diaspora, and of course, also in Africa. So we're going to be looking at it from two perspectives, two important perspectives. So Professor Luwa Femi will be helping us to understand it from the point of view of transpersonal psychology. He's an expert in that, of course, he will explain himself just now. Then, of course, that will be followed by Dr. Tawanda, who is an assistant associate professor in the U.S. in El Paso. He'll be uh, looking at the angle from personhood. From the time that uh, Dr. Tawanda told me about it, I never even heard of that word. It, it was the first time I heard of it, and it had been very important for me. So, of course, today he's going to be uh, doing first 15 minutes about the topic. Then, of course, we move into a Q&A session. All right. Why don't we just jump into the conversation? There is a lot on the plate, so let's go. So we are starting with uh, Professor Luwa Femi, who is joining us from the UK. All right, sir. Professor Luwa Femi, you could maybe tell the people who you are, then you just move into the conversation. Let's roll. <laughs> okay. I mean, thank you so much, uh, 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 Mr. Bay and uh, Professor Tawanda. Uh, thank you for joining on this conversation. Uh, my name is Ulua Femi. So, uh, I'm a professor of transpersonal psychology and the founder of Elroy London Academy and also the vice chancellor of Elroy London University. And so today I'll be looking at the question of identity crisis uh, from the transpersonal perspective. So I'm going to share with you my, uh, my slide here. My topic, like I said, it's I'm looking at, you know, uh, the question of identity uh, from transpersonal psychology perspective. And I'm looking at the very concept of uh, transpersonal identity. I have titled this uh, short presentation, uh, it's subtitled as Understanding Ontological Crisis of, of, the, of the Human Existence. And so, because when we're talking about identity crises, uh, I believe that you have to look at the ontological source of one's identity. And so for me, I strongly believe that identity crisis is coming from an ontological crisis. And so my subtopic tonight is to look at the ontological crisis of human existence. And therefore, uh, the first question, uh, when it comes to the issue of identity, is the ontological crisis where I said, where did I come from? You know, you know, talking about identity, it is often said that you cannot understand your identity if you don't have an understanding of your source. Uh, your source determines your identity. So your sense of identity and your concept of self is originating from your concept of source. And so for me, and for us in the transpersonal uh, psychology movement, we are looking at identity source from eternal origin. So ontological crisis is what we believe to be the source of identity crisis. Now, what do we mean by ontological crisis? This is a term coined to describe the crisis a human being goes through when its model of ontology or of which is the of its reality changes. In human context, we believe a clear example of an ontological crisis is humanity's loss of faith in creationism. And this is the ontological foundation of transpersonal identity, that is creationism, transpersonal creationism. Now, when we talk about creationism, it's in philosophy, it's from the word creatio ex nihilo, which is a Latin term meaning creation from nothing. Now, it is the belief that God created the universe from nothing. Now, this concept is found in many religions, such as Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, which are all indigenous religions. By the way, I may drop it here on this platform that Christianity that we practice today originated from Judaism, and Judaism is an indigenous religion of the indigenous people of the Jewish culture. And so uh, when we're talking about Christianity, you have to look from its root, its indigenous roots in Judaism. Now, the three Abrahamic religions uh, believe in the concept of creationism. They are all creationist religion. And in creationism also is a very 
ontological foundation of transpersonal identity. In other words, we talk about the doctrine of Christio ex nihilo, that perceived that God created the world out of nothing. Now watch this, from no pre-existing matter, no space or time. Now, there are two basic types of creation that can be distinguished from this doctrine of creation here. Number one, creation ex nihilo, that is from the absolute nothingness, and then creation ex materia, from the materia. Now, because of time, the creation ex nihilo, from nothing, is talking about the spiritual creative power of God, that man is created as a spirit out of nothing. However, the body of man is existing as a material individual living in a materialistic world is the creation from ex materia that is the use of already materialistic source that is the body of a man is formed from the soil and that is an that now bring us to a very important source of identity that is man as a spiritual nature and it also has a biological identity now the challenge here is that majority dominant identity philosophy of humanity is coming from materialism and this is where the problem lies and so the dominant philosophy of ontology and also the source of most people identity is coming from a materialist ontology and so there's a materialist ontology crisis now materialism a form of philosophical monism which holds that matter is the fundamental substance in nature and that all things including mental state and consciousness are a result of material interaction of material things now this view also states that that everything that exists is matter and that all phenomena are the result of material interaction as we know that in ontology as a branch of philosophy question what is being and existence now materialism as an ontological philosophy is built on the materialist view that the world is made up of countless events that are the material effect of nature and culture this event and structure system of mechanism are what produce the world and human history what does this simply mean the materialist ontology only view man as a biological entity and so when you're talking about your identity which coming from a materialist ontology you are only looking at your identity from your biological existence and that comes with ethnicity uh with your uh cultural identity ethnic identity um your career identity all these form of identity are built on the materialist ontology and if you operate in that dimension that's a crisis because that is not a true source of human identity so from the ontology of christianism we can see that man has a tripartite view and that is also established in the abrahamic religion especially the christian theology said the tripartite view our trichonomy holds that humankind is a composite of three distinct components body spirit and soul so when you are building your identity if you build your identity on the body that is your ethnic identity is built on materialist ontology your cultural identity is built on materialistic ontology you see that so cultural career all these are materialistic foundation of identity and that is not the true nature of who we are because all these we fade away and it doesn't give us a sense of meaning and purpose in life so man is a tripartite being is a spirit he has a soul and he lives in a body and you can see from this diagram man spirit connect to god and is able to con communicate with god by intuition by conscious and communion so your spirit gives you your spiritual god consciousness then your soul gives you your psychological self-consciousness that's where you have your mind your emotion and your will and then through your body you have your physiological world consciousness and you are able to relate with your environment now the danger here is that majority of humanity source of identity is coming from dualism that is the soul and the body 
And when you look at every form of what we, our self-esteem, our self-concept, build on this dualism of this mind and the body, that is not who you are. Your true essence, according to transpersonal philosophy, you are a spirit. So your true identity is a spiritual identity. You have a spirit, you live in a body. Now, when you look at the trichonomy theology, also known as the trichonomy theology, which is a clear view that humans are made up of three distinct parts, the body, the soul, and spirit. And this view contrasts the bipartite view or dichotomy view that soul and spirit are different from. That the trichonomy view originated from the Greek philosophy. And then the biblical theology adopted that. The soul and the spirit are being interchangeable. But the main decision between the two is that the spirit controls the body and is the principle of life and action, while the soul is the subject of the action. Now, the spirit is who you are. Your true identity, according to transpersonal philosophy, you, man is a spirit trying to have a physical experience. So that is your true identity. So if you build your identity on ethnicity, on career identity, or uh, you know, on religious identity, all these are subject to change because they are not going to give you meaning and purpose in life. And once we continue to operate in a, in a materialistic source of identity, there is going to be crisis of identity because our true color, our true essence of who we are is a transpersonal self-identity. Now, what is transpersonal? It is defined as experiences in which the sense of identity or self extend beyond that it trans the individual or personal to encompass wider aspects of humankind, life, and psyche or cosmos. The transpersonal self is not identified exclusively with the separate self, but as by virtue of direct experience and this identification from ego, you see that? Discover the universal ground of being that sustain it, and that is, is a spiritual self. Your true essence is a spiritual self. And um, when you now build your identity with on the spiritual creationist ontology, that is who you are. You live beyond time and space. But any identity that is built on materialist ontology is going to lead to crisis. It's going to lead to division. It goes to war. And that's why today we look at this discrimination in the world today. The division in the world today is because the dominant source of our identity is on a materialist ontology. So man is beyond that. So the true identity of man is spiritual identity. And this can be defined as an understanding of who you are in relation to God and finding meaning in life through that connection. It can also refer to the human spirit and how it affects different aspects of life. Some say that spirituality is more of an individual practice uh, than religion, which is a set of shared beliefs and practices. Spirituality can also involve developing belief about the meaning of life and how you connect with others, and it can also include a sense of purpose and peace. Now, your spiritual self is your most beautiful, the most powerful form. It is the authentic self the unconditioned part, the you without your pattern. So in summary, man is a tripartite being, that's it. Your identity is beyond your body. You are a spirit, you have a soul, man lives in a body. Our true essence of our identity is our spiritual nature, our spiritual self. You are a spirit and spirit has no gender. There is neither male nor female in spirit. And in spirit, there is no color. There is no ethnicity. There is no color. There is no gender. Now, if humanity embraced the spiritual identity, they will be able to solve the division, the discrimination in the world today. Therefore, the transpersonal approach to identity is coming from what? A creationist ontology that man is a spirit he has a soul he lives in the body thank you right thank you so much for that uh, that is that is really uh, full of value that is really full of value and of course i put down some questions that i'm going to ask you uh, of course that is where we enter into the q a session just now all right just like a professor Luwa for me dr tawanda it's your turn please go ahead and 
uh, introduce your topic, personhood. Then, of course, we will pick it up from there, uh, the Q&A session. I am uh, Tawanda Chabikwa, and I'm over here, assistant professor at the University of Texas, El Paso. And what I am interested in sharing with you about is the concept of personhood. First of all, thank you, Dr. Uh, Olafemi, for your your talk there on the transpersonal. Uh, and I love that approach. I've been very fascinated by, uh, you know, African and black psychology as well as spirituality and philosophy uh, for quite a while. Now, for me, the approach that I, I, I have taken in trying to dig into this idea of being human in the world today is the notion of personhood. Um, I found it very useful for me to begin from uh, an African place, right? Now, of course, there's no singular African place. Uh, there are many worldviews, world senses, uh, and many different ontologies and epistemologies in Africa. But I was curious what would happen if I chose one uh, and followed it through to see what connections might happen concerning this being a person in the world today. And this comes from, as uh, Obey said, the complexity of living in an anti-Black world, uh, historically anti-Black world, <laughs> right? Um, in which Black humanity is always questioned uh, or must always prove itself somehow, or is considered less than in the imaginary hierarchy uh, of, of the uh, dominant culture or so-called dominant culture. So I just thought, what happens if I think of this personhood uh, factor? Being from Zimbabwe myself, we have the word munu, uh, which the NU part of it is very similar to the NTU part of Bantu, right? Uh, the nu part. Like, that is what a person is. Uh, how do we try to understand what a person is from this perspective, right? So what happens, for instance, if, um, let's see, I should be going to the next slide now. There we go. What happens when we think about things from these various different uh, Africana uh, ontologies? How do we then think about what a person is? And as was mentioned in the materialistic perspective, um, we can always begin with the body, you know, uh, because it's an okay place to begin because it's there, we can see it, we can feel it and so forth. We don't believe that we are the body, but we need to think about what the body is. And when we do so, we understand that multiple uh, uh, African cultures have a very clear understanding of the interplay between matter and spirit when considering what the body is or what the human being is. A clear understanding of the material and non-material aspects of existing in the world. Uh, you may refer to it as the soul and the spirit. You know, you may refer to it as ori consciousness. You may refer to ashe or other things of that sort. But this clear understanding that our existence is not limited to just the material, as is proven by the workings of consciousness, conscience, and deeper interconnections that we feel and see. Now, for, I'll say historically, recent history, I'm, I'm thinking uh, one or 2,000 years, uh, certain cultures have relied a lot on the idea of matter, the biological self, as was mentioned, right? Or the ideas of form and concept, what we see and what we name it, how we conceptualize it mentally as a thing. Yet others uh, also understand the importance of knowledge and experience. Now, by knowledge, I'm not speaking of just what you have learned uh, from the outside coming in, but knowledge and experience being intertwined in a much deeper way that goes into and beyond 
the body and the workings of the body itself. So basically, what we're talking about is a difference between an anthropocentric perspective and a cosmocentric perspective. So anthropocentric, we're talking about centering the, the human person, right? <laughs> them and their body, this guy over here, <laughs> right? And what's going on inside of them and so forth. And then how that interacts with the rest of the world. That's a very humanist approach. Um, how I interact with the world as in how I can affect the world, how I can manipulate the world, uh, and how I exist in it in that way, but still centering uh, me and my skin-bound body uh, as me, right, and stopping there. Whereas when we look at the cosmocentric perspective, which is very familiar to many indigenous cultures, uh, including uh, Euro-Western indigenous cultures, pre-medieval medieval cultures, it was basic knowledge that you are not just your skin and your and everything inside it, right? You are a part of your community, your family. Uh, you are a part of nature. You are also connected to the ancestors, those who came before you, and to all of creation. But this is not just similar to the anthropocentric thing where we create an ecology of which the human is a part. No, they're saying that you actually are all of those things. And most importantly, you are connected to the unborn, which means that you are part of writing the future as well through who you are today as a person. So when I understand that I am all of these things, my model of what a human being is changes. Now I am no longer the one on the left. Now I am this, right? Part of a much greater continuum of things. My existence radiates outward from all of these things. I understand simply that I am because of a greater connection to other things. In this way, all being is relational. When we think of the term Ubuntu that is thrown around consistently by many people, I like to think of uh, how many people simplify it as I am because we are. But when you think about it ex um, more, more clearly, it really means I am a person because of other persons and beings. As in without other persons or beings, I am not. You see how that utterly undoes uh, all the individualistic, anthropocentric, uh, and even humanist modes of being in a very big way, because being is relational. Now, this wonderful scholar from Mozambique, Dr. Jose Cosa, uh, he's at Pennsylvania State University currently, came up with, coined this theory uh, of Cosmo Ubuntu uh, to expand from the regular understanding of Ubuntu. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But just speaking of personhood by itself, we can then define personhood as that which emerges from, through, with and in relationship to and because of the world. Now, to repeat that, personhood emerges, is not a given. Uh, if I was born just floating in a vacuum, <laughs> which doesn't exist, but if I was born into nothingness, I would not be in person because there's nothing to relate to. There is no other personhoods to relate to. There is no nature, there's no community and so forth, right? And notice how nature becomes a part of personhood as well. So we don't hierarchize humankind as above nature and so forth, right? We are coexisting with it. But because of this, personhood is malleable. That is, it can be changed. It is permeable, meaning it can be influenced by all of these other things it is in relationship to as well, right? And also it is plural. It is never singular. It is it's multidimensional. 
and also transdimensional in that it transcends dimensions themselves. Because in this understanding, I simply understand that I am the world and the world is me. So just as I am within this cosmos, the cosmos is actually also within me. Now, the moral responsibility of being in such a cosmos becomes great when you understand how deeply you are connected to it. So the idea then becomes that the body is just part of a greater sacred geography that extends beyond yourself and not just in the material world. Because matter is considered spirit, because everything emerges from spirit, that which is unmanifest, as it were. So we understand that when we're thinking of this crisis of identity, I, I like to call it more a crisis of the imagination because of what uh, colonialism, slavery, and other global violences did to the human capacity to imagine what's possible. <laughs> I like to think of uh, the process that's necessary as remembering. Now, Ngugi Wationgo, uh, among others, uh, have constantly described these crises of the imagination that Black and African and, in truth, the entire world is going through. And remembering, according to what Yongo is what's needed, uh, he puts the hyphen there between the re and the membering in order to hint at that fact that you are uh, recollecting different parts of yourself, different members of yourself, right? Your limbs, your so forth. You're reattaching yourself, making yourself whole again by remembering what we have been taught by wisdom traditions and also what we are learning from contemporary sciences and quantum physics, but we literally need to take time to piece ourselves together because what violence does and uh, post-traumatic violence does, it is it fragments the self. It fragments personhood. It makes you separate rather than whole. So what is necessary is this process of remembering, and this can happen in many, many different ways. But the idea is simply if that uh, cosmocentric notion of personhood is myself, what can I then do in order to remember myself, to reattach myself to my truest self rather than living in false self? And this true self is this combination of things that are material, that are spiritual, that are mental, that are psychological, and so forth. And what I'm trying to do is to create the most sustainable relationships among those things within myself. Because I understand that I live into the past because of ancestry, I live into the future because the unborn are coming through myself and my actions and my relationship to the world. My essence will always continue because it is part of a greater whole. When I understand these things, my life becomes simpler. I become more grounded because I'm not moved and thrown around like a leaf in the wind by stock market changes, by the latest fashion trend, by the latest uh, political drama that's happening in the world. Right? I'm not moved and overly shaken even by health scares to me because I understand that I am grounded in something much greater, much, much older than anything else that exists. And when I ground myself in this concept of personhood, I become a much more conscious participant and agent in the world. My morality goes beyond the moralities of religions and philosophies. It goes much deeper than that, because I understand that I am that. So, personhood has been the way that I've been trying to move through this and explain to the world, or to share with the world, the, truly the blessings that arise when we can let go of certain ways of relating to the world that we've been taught 
to live along with. Ways of relating to the world that make us feel confused about who and what we are. When I have this model of personhood, it is up to me to learn about and to become a part of my community, to learn about and become a part of my family, to learn about and become a part of my ancestors, to learn about the wisdom traditions that have taught me my place in the world, and to learn about how other cultures see these things. In doing so, I am already participating in creating a better possibility for those who are yet to come and the unborn. But I no longer live in fear, isolation, and self-doubt because I understand that I belong and that I am a part of. Thank you so much, Dr. Tawanda. Um, that is really liberating. Of course, uh, all of you can uh, own your camera now because the Q&A session starts here. And I am so happy that we're having this conversation. And I think we should be able to, to do this ourselves, uh, to take up the conversation that is about us and to really uh, flush it out. Of course, leveraging on the experiences of people like you and uh, Professor Lua Femi, and of course, many other important experts out there who are helping us to see what is even in front of us. Because now, you are not telling us to come to Harvard to understand what is humanity, or to understand who we are. Uh, you are actually redirecting our focus to who we already are. And I think this is really important. My first question would be, uh, I think it will go to you first, then I'll move to Professor Lua Femi. Where is the question of identity crisis coming from? What is your take on that? Mm. Now, of course, everything I say, uh, it should be clear, it's just my understanding and opinion. It's not the truth, <laughs> the ultimate truth. And I'm curious what other people will think about it. Um, for me, the question of identity crisis is, at least in the context, if we're speaking about uh, African and African descended people, I think it is part of the invention of Africa. I think there's an extent to which there have been direct, um, structured and thought out ways to convince us that we don't know who we are. Is it not easier to take over people who don't know who they are? To show up and say, you don't know who you are because you don't have libraries, even when they burnt down our libraries, or you don't have alphabetic, alphanumeric writing systems, so you have no history, <laughs> or your religions aren't monotheistic, so you have no this. Africans for the longest time, as part of the invention of Africa, <laughs> the invention of, I hope we understand what I'm saying there, that's a <laughs> situation, but as part of the invention of Africa, anything African had to be undone, you see, it had to be fragmented and pulled apart and so forth, to make us seem as though we had not thought out our personhood well enough, like we're just roaming uh, in the forests amongst other creatures, unconscious and waiting to be colonized and given electricity. So I think this identity crisis has been a, a long time fabrication that has been sustained and in many ways internalized as well uh, by, by Africans. You know, I think many dominant uh, cultures or ideologies, uh, ideologies that want to take over uh, anything, really take the time to undermine what already exists. Uh, even when we talk about patriarchy, it exists partly from its undermining of femininity for centuries, right? So when we speak of this identity crisis, I think we need to understand to what extent it, is it real? Uh, to what extent is it fabricated? But there is a deep connection between the fabricated and the real once it's internalized. So we will now walk around being confused. <laughs> um, but the truth is, that's where I like the idea of remembering. Rather than creating a new identity, we really need to remember. 
And the great thing in many African philosophies about time is we can also remember the future because we're part of creating it. So this remembering is really, I think, this antidote to this so-called identity crisis in a big way. Uh, and it takes a lot of new learning, old learning, and contemplative and reflective practices to get there, and conversations like this. So I'm grateful to be a part of it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Tawanda. You see, uh, because of the conversation that I have with people like you and many other important out there uh, who are shaping our reality, I have even come to appreciate my culture even more. You see, there, there are abilities, I, there is something that you share, and uh, Professor Luwa Femi uh, also have shared something similar to that. Of course, I'm going to post the question to him just now related to the thing that I've already posed to you. In that when we have been put into these small buses where we have been told this is who we are, and of course, that bus is, is flip around often all the time, so that it looked like the intention, the original design of putting out the buses is so that we can be confused. They say this is the this is the up. They, when we believe that is the up, they flip it around again. Now, what used to be the up is now the sideways. Now we are confused. We don't know what to do. Then we ask them, where did you say is the up? What are, we have been here. We should have figured this out, you see. Anyway, Professor Luwafe, I have a question for you. And the question, of course, is related to this initial part of it, which is, where did this identity crisis coming from? Because now, of course, we are looking at humanity, but we're also looking at Africans, because our target audience here are Africans, are people of African descent. Because we are the ones that are suffering from the crisis, even though other people are suffering from the crisis, but we are looking at it from the point of view of Africa and how we are suffering this identity crisis. And as a people, we are the oldest in human history that is recorded. How come we are confused of who we are? Professor Lua Femi, that is a question for you. What is your take on that? Well, I mean, thank you. Uh, since you you decided to restrict me to African, you know, an African identity crisis, uh, you know. Uh, so in terms of that, you you have to go back to the colonial trauma. Uh, so the identity crisis for the African people, whether in the indigenous African nations or African in diaspora, are uh, suffering from, uh, is attributed to the colonial trauma. And what is that trauma? Uh, that is trauma of inferiority complex that has come from many years of dominations. And because what simply happened is that, as you know, that uh, we are people that have our own indigenous ontology that is actually built on spirituality. I've said it before, before the white man came and brought Christianity to us, we have our indigenous religion and we have our indigenous belief system. Now, part of that indigenous system is our self-concept, okay? So we have our self-concept, our sense of self. So our sense of self is coming from our indigenous psychology, which is built on spirituality. So we know that. Now, the white man came with his gunpowder gun and came with his own concept of self that he built on the Western philosophy. Now, the, the outcome of that, as you know, is the creation in our psyche of an inferior concept of self. And in the process of domination and colonization, Africans begin to lose their sense of self, not just only doubting it, they lost, it was lost completely because they now look up to the white man, to the supremacists, the imperialists, for their same de de definition. I've said it before. Whoever you look up to for your definition can cancel you. Thank you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> All right. It is like uh, Dr. Tawanda wanted to say something about that. I see you here. Mm. Yeah, please respond. Because here we are just talking. We are just talking as brothers, and we are uh, learning, and we are also happy with other people that are listening to us to learn. Uh, Tawanda, please respond if you have anything to say about that. Oh, no, I was just agreeing. Uh, I like that idea of, you know, whoever you look up to for your definition, you give them the power to cancel you, you know, or, or to shape you who you are. You, you, you are now working at their will and whim. Mm. And very true, this idea of self-concept lies at the root of it. Uh, because once you are in control of someone's self-concept, uh, 
mm-hmm. or at least they can't control their own. You have a degree of power over them. Mm-hmm. So when I think of this idea of you know remembering and personhood and things, the idea is really to uh, reignite uh, a solid self-concept. Mm-hmm. Because even when we talk about education, you know, and, and we, are, we, we are educated people here, <laughs> two doctors talking and so forth, the education itself has the capacity to ruin your self-concept or to alienate you from original self-concepts and things. Mm-hmm. And we live in a world where there are so many things vying for control of our self-concept, mm-hmm. right? Especially in a very materialistic, capitalistic, commodified world. Mm-hmm. Many people's self-concept is around their fashion, you know, their mm-hmm. hair, mm-hmm. you know, uh, who are they dating, who are they marrying, their job, as was said before, right? But there's no true understanding of who you are as a person. So yes, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, the crisis really is rooted in self-concept um, and maybe our failure to see ourselves. <laughs> Many things stand in the way. Thank you for that. All right. I have another question that I like uh, Professor Luwa for me to respond to, and it have to do with um, the tripartite nature, which is that ma is not just uh, one facet. There are different dimensions to it. Where are we having the, the confusion now? Which, of course, of course, I think we also come to understand that, okay, this confusion is also created. No? It's not just mm-hmm. natural in nature. It is created. Mm-hmm. But where are we really having this confusion in this uh, three dimension that you have explained in the tripartite nature? Could you say anything about that, Professor Lua Femin? Yeah, I mean, thank you uh, for, for that question. Uh, I mean, as you can see, that uh, uh, the dominant ontological consciousness, not just the African people, of humanity itself. And again, you trace that to the colonized curriculum. You see that? So when you look at the curriculum, it was built on which ontology? So I've said it before that your ontology determines your epistemology. You see that? And so your sense of epistemological foundation is coming from an ontological paradigm, which in this case, the dominant ontological paradigm of the Eurocentric Western curriculum is on is a, is a materialistic ontology. And so man has been reduced to the mind and the body. And therefore, all the intervention, all our philosophy, all our education is just educating the mind and the body. And that is the cause of the, of the crisis. And for us in Africa, I said it before, uh, before the colonial master came, we are in tune with our spiritual identity. We are in tune with our ancestor. We have our ritualistic system for contacting the spiritual realm, which is form of our society. Now, the materialist imperialist came with, with all the trappings of modernization and civilization from the Western world. And with the material comfort, which there's nothing wrong in that. But the danger of it is that it has eroded our spiritual sense of self. And then we operate a materialist ontology. Thank you. I have a question that I'm going to ask to both of you, both uh, Dr. Um, Tawanda and also you, Professor Lua Femi. It had to do with consciousness. Uh, of course, it was uh, Dr. Tawanda that was making reference to that just now. But I, of course, I think it's something that can comfortably be asked also to you. Uh, what is consciousness? And how does that affect uh, or influence the uh, the identity crisis that we are talking about today? Okay, you know, uh, of course, from the tripartite framework of human nature, so there are three forms of consciousness, foundational form of consciousness. We have our spirit gives us our spiritual God consciousness. Then our soul that accommodates the mind, the emotion, and the will. Uh, is a source of our psychological consciousness, and that's how we relate with people. Okay, then our body is a source of our physiological con- world consciousness that we relate in the material existence of reality, and through our body, we relate with the environment. So, there are three foundational dimensions of consciousness, and this is able to achieve by the soul, because the soul is a seed of consciousness. So through the soul, we are conscious of spiritual reality, and through the soul, we are conscious of physical reality. However, the dominant consciousness that we have in the world today is our material consciousness. We even forget, and that's why I love what uh, Dr. Tanda is saying about remembering, remembering 
remembering it is there it is locked in our consciousness we have to ignite this memory to go back into remembering to know that i'm not just my body i'm a spiritual entity and i exist beyond time and space thank you thank you so much for that i appreciate that all right uh, the, this question actually was originally designed for dr tawanda uh, uh, you see, Dr. Tawanda, you were saying something that I really like a lot because you lay a lot of emphasis on the body, that you use the body uh, as, um, as a metaphor to explain a bit part of what we are talking about here. And of course, I remember that uh, in one of the episodes that I uh, I had with you, there was a lot about that, where you also talk about dance, the movement, and how the body is used as a carrier of information. And I think that is also relevant to the remembrance at the end of the day. So the question, therefore, is um, when you look at consciousness, uh, um, first of all, how do you explain consciousness from the point of view of personhood? And how does that relate to the identity crisis we are talking about today? What is your take on that? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, for me, and uh, I agree everything that was just said, you know, um about consciousness as well and and i and i and i like to leave it to the professionals of transpersonal psychology <laughs> to get into that terminology uh because there's also an element of uh what is consciousness from a, uh, an african perspective right and for in 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 addition to what was just said about it Consciousness is is that uh, capacity to be aware of our participation in this world that is both material and spiritual. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I understand it. And as a part of that, uh, for me, the body is very important. I think uh, indigenous Africans have known and many other cultures for the longest time that the body is actually a wonderful technology for spiritual activity. Like we can use the body to access that through song, rhythm, storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Africans have used the embodied technologies for a very, very long time, <laughs> you know? Uh, so understanding that, that because through whatever divine coincidence, uh, our spirit and our soul fell into our bodies or are are very much connected to it, even if they leak out and extend a bit, (laughs) right? We have uh, within ourselves the capacity to participate as holistically and positively in our cosmos and to contribute positively to this migration of spirits and souls that we call life, right? And we are all just passing through these bodies as it is. now, if I'm to understand sort of your question about consciousness, uh, Obe, are you saying, are you asking sort of where consciousness comes from or how you, or how it functions or its role in this crisis of uh, identity? Yeah, of course, if it's possible to understand where it's coming from and also its role in the, uh, in the identity crisis, it will be fine. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to learn as much as okay. possible about so, this. I will say uh, my understanding philosophically, <laughs> depending on uh, on on who you ask, but if I'm to over overly generalize uh, African cosmologies, the understanding is basically everything is spirit. We are all spirit. We all emerge from the divine spark of the universe. Indeed which is why self-knowledge is the highest form of knowledge, because that connects you to the divine source, mm-hmm. as it were. So in terms of where it comes from, one might even say consciousness is the divine knowing itself through me. That's I don't know what you think, do so <laughs> love me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is a big question. So I don't any thoughts on this? <laughs> Anyway, maybe Professor, we'll have to respond later. But th- there is something that I really find very interesting here that I'm, I will ask you to respond. But this time, I want to see if it, if you can be limited to your origin as Zimbabwe. Now, the idea is that you talked of um, anthropocentric and cosmocentric. Uh, this cosmocentric will be very relevant to the concept of Ubuntu. Um, 
And because Ubu, in the, by the spirit of Ubuntu now, or by the philosophy of Ubuntu, we are actually connecting everything. We are not separated. Because I think this is very important for us in that I, I think I make reference to this in 2010, because in 2010, I wrote a book that I titled On the Development in Africa, My Hands Are Clean. A part of that book, I was uh, trying to accuse Share of the abuse of the Niger Delta, and I was saying, okay, let's look at the common sense. If Share BP, who of course is accused of the pollution of the Niger Delta, was a company owned by the people of the Niger Delta, they will not destroy the Niger Delta because they know that their life depends on this land. In fact, I did make mention of it to you in one of the episodes that you said, not that their life depends on this land. Their life is this land. They are this land. Therefore, mm -hmm. you cannot destroy yourself. Mm -hmm. Except something is really absolutely wrong with you. Of course, I know something is wrong with us. Now I say, okay, let's take that argument to Europe. Say, share BP, discover this oil in France or in, in UK. Would they destroy the environment, the ecological environment where they are exploring oil? I said, the answer is also no, because they know that they are destroying their people. And because this is their people, they will not destroy it. Just mm. to add to that, before I come to the question, you see, some of the biggest oil reserves in the world are actually in Canada and the United States. Okay, let's say the United States is not exploring oil, so we cannot say how they are doing it. But let's look at Norway, for example. Just because you want to explore oil, does it mean you need to destroy the people, destroy their democracy, destroy their system, so that it is easy for you to extract the material? Because this is the justification for the over-exploitation of resources in Africa, in that we can take the resources, destroy the land, we can create conflict, say the people are fighting, therefore, as they are fighting, they don't know what is happening. The confusion, the crisis, is therefore controlled because it is created and it's manipulated, the people don't understand what is going on. Anyway, mm. now this is the question. How do you explain African cosmology or cosmocentrics? Look at that from the point of view of Zimbabwe culture, because I want people to be rooted in this. Of course, I'm going to pass the same question to Oluwa Femi, and they will exp explain it based on the Yoruba tradition. This at me. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, first, I'd like to, <laughs> that's a very big <laughs> topic there. But uh, first, I'd like to say, like, uh, when we talk about Ubuntu, and remember, I mentioned this scholar, Jose Kosa, uh, coined the term Cosmo Ubuntu. Uh, uh, and Cosmo Ubuntu is, is a, becomes a global phenomenon. <clears throat> because uh, I'm going to quote him here. It's used to describe the non-discriminatory non-hierarchical understanding of humans that derives from African cosmology. Accordingly, Cosmo Ubuntu is the voluntary embrace of Ubuntu as a foundational value system in our participation in planetary conviviality without forcing universality. In this value system, personhood applies to all humans and precludes individuation, classification, and hierarchies. In other words, humans are humans because of humans. And thus, race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic class, and ethnic or geopolitical origin are incommensurate categories. So Cosmo Ubuntu really connects us all in that way. So if I'm coming from Zimbabwe, I'll know that my name is Tawanda, which means we are now many. My last name is Chabikwa, and that comes from uh, previously being called Runganga and so forth, two big guys to cook, but the metaphor here is healing and herbalism and being able to mix medicines well. I know that's the name of my father, right? I also know that my spiritual totem is the zebra because everyone has a spiritual totem in Zimbabwe. It's typically an animal or a body part of an animal. Mine is the zebra. So this now connects me beyond my biological genealogy to my spiritual genealogy of everyone else from wherever they may be who may have this totem. But it also connects me to the land and to the animals and to nature because I'm not allowed to eat the zebra or kill it. <laughs> but I also 
think about the zebra as a metaphor for many other characteristics that a human would like to embrace and embody. And the praise poem about that totem teaches me this spiritual genealogy and histories of other great participants of that totem. Uh, past chiefs, great warriors, etc., etc., and the myths that surround them. So now I'm connected to this history. I know I carry this in my blood wherever I go, indeed, and that idea of the zebra. I also know my mother's totem as well, right, being the heart, and what goes on with that as well. And she's from a different, uh, I hate using the word tribe, <laughs> clan, maybe, <laughs> right. So there will be a group uh, of people. <laughs> a different ethnic group in Zimbabwe as well. And that spreads out. So I know I'm a combination of these two ethnic groups and those spiritual genealogies and histories that happen there. I know through music and song, my history of the liberation struggle in Zimbabwe, right? And all the clashes and encounters and lives that were lost in the colonial struggles and things of that sort. I know uh, of certain, uh, call them Mondoro or lion spirits, spirit mediums that have been existed throughout history and fought on this side <laughs> uh, for our liberation and things of that sort. So when I think of all of these things, I know that I am a part of something bigger. I'm just a part in a story that existed long before me and will continue long after me. What I am to understand is what I'm doing at this point that I am with who I am to contribute to this great epic narrative, right, uh, of this migration of, soul, of souls throughout, the, throughout history. So no matter where I go, I know that that is who I am, right, uh, that I am a person because of all these other persons who have been and will be. And when I encounter any other human in the world, I give them that same honor of knowing that they too are a person, right? With a biological, spiritual, and psychological genealogy and all of that. And that must be honored because now my personhood and theirs are in an encounter and nobody leaves an encounter unaffected. Mm. Nobody leaves an encounter unaffected. So, while, say, for example, the colonizer thinks they are winning in a violent encounter, when we look at histories of psychology and mental wellness in Europe and so forth, we can see that they too were affected by the violence they inflicted. These pathologies do not come out of nowhere. <laughs> and because in Zimbabwe we have words for it and gauzy or negative spirits that emerge from killing other people, right that then drive you crazy and things yeah right how many serial killers do you find in africa <laughs> right rates of uh, unnecessary you know uh sexual crimes and weird things like that there are certain things that are just strange <laughs> that don't happen as often in africa <laughs> you know but these violences that are inflicted in a, in a violent encounter we know that they affect both the victim and the victimizer and I know that just from growing up Zimbabwe, because I know who I am, I know my totem. I know the existence of spirits and uh, spirituality. I know that this energy moves around and I must participate in it responsibly because it will circle back to me. Like you're saying, why destroy somebody's land for oil? There are ways to extract oil more easily or just leave the oil alone and use sunshine and wind and water <laughs> for your energy, but no. We must impose violence and take. That comes to me from a mentality of scarcity, the myth of scarcity that the world lives in because of the materialistic paradigm we're in. This fear of scarcity, this fear of there's not enough, this fear of I cannot share with others is really what's taking over the world. So when, when I think of that, my grounding in my Zimbabwean uh, or Chivanu culture allows me to live in abundance because there's so much abundance in me and beyond me through the ancestors and through the unborn. Resources are limitless. I do not have to kill or fight. All I need to do is be generous and share. And the same will happen for me. 
so that's an example of how I exist in this uh, personhood factor. And yes, it is a challenge living in a materialistic world when you think that way, because you still have to live in institutions and jobs and work with things and people, but I think it's worth it at the end of the day. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. You see, this is actually, it's liberating at the end of the day, you know, because we, we are saying, why are we confused now? Why are we not able to live life the way we are supposed to live? It's because we are confused. Because imagine a simple idea like understanding that there is a balance between knowing that your life depends on how you relate to other life, nature, and everything around you. You will be conscious of how you put your leg because you know that it affects other people. You can't just say, okay, I feel angry today, so everybody must be angry. I just begin to do anything anyhow. No, you can't do that. Mm. <laughs> anyway, now... I want us to see how this is explained also from the point of view of Yoruba tradition, because Yoruba is a, is a significant uh, culture in Africa. So, uh, Professor Luwa Femi, could you help us understand it? How do you explain this? Okay, actually, they are different between the epocentric, the uh, anthropocentric, and cosmocentric. And of course, from cosmocentric now, we are looking at the, uh, the Ubuntu uh, cosmology or the Ubuntu philosophy of life. How do you explain in, in Yoruba tradition, maybe in line with the idea of identity crisis that we have today? How do the Yoruba people look at the world and found themselves? What were supposed to be their way of understanding the balance in the life that they live? Please help us. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I can see from the discourse uh, of uh, Dr. Tawanda when talk about Ubuntu cosmology, and it's talking about uh, that all are part of everything, in the sense that we are all from the same source. And and for us in the uh, in the transpersonal uh, school of thought, so we are talking about we are all part of the universal consciousness, you know. So and because we are all part of the same origin, and then that also is traceable back to the concept of creationism, that is ultimate reality created reality in the spiritual world and in the physical world. And so the Ifa cosmology, Ifa theology of the Yoruba tradition is a creationist religion. So based on Ifa theology, Ifa believes that Oludumari, that is the ultimate reality, created everything, okay? And so from there, we are all part of that creation. We are all part of universal consciousness. So when I see you, I don't see any difference in you because you and me, we are part of the same source. So why should I fight you? Why should I hate you? You know, so that is the foundational understanding of that cultural epistemology that leads to our Yoruba value system. And in that regard also, it also leads to what today I conceptualize as spiritual ecology. Now, the shell people are talking about, it's purely coming from a materialistic view of reality because they don't have that concept in their framework of knowledge that we are part of the environment. So man and the environment are part of universal consciousness. So when you understand that spiritual ecology, you'll be able to look after. But because they are driven by the materialistic and, and capitalist agenda, they don't have understanding. Again, they are operating in a materialistic ontology. And that's the question. Right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, actually, this conversation is broken down into three parts. We just finished the first part, which has to do with what are we actually talking about. The second part where, where, they are, where we are entering now is the consequence of what we are talking about. Then the concluding part will be the solution. Now, uh, we're talking of identity crisis as it relates to Africans and African diaspora. Why? Is it even important? What is the effect of identity crisis on the life that we live on, on, on us as a people, what effect? Uh, so when you talk about, uh, yes, definitely I'm going to approach it from mental health. <laughs> of course, yes. I look at it from mental health. I look at it from self-psychology. You know, you're talking about self-psychology and that is self-regulation. So it is found that your psychology of self, that is your sense of self, your concept of self is part of your self-regulation. That means my understanding my conceptual framework of my sense of self, it is a foundation of my self-regulation. 
Now, part of that sense of self is my source of my sense of identity. You see that? So I have an identity that is built on a conceptual self image. So that image of my identity is what dictates my actions and my behavior. So if anything tampers with that sense of self, it is going to affect my motivation, my pursuit in life, and ultimately it's also going to affect my, my mental resilience to cope with the stress of life. Okay, so when you're looking at how do I develop coping strategy, mental resilience to deal with anything that comes to me in life is coming from my self-concept. And so now imagine a man, an individual that is going to crisis of identity, that sense of self has been tampered with. So there's self-doubt. And if you go back to history, the greatest battle you fight in your life is self-doubt. And the moment you start doubting yourself, it will affect your pursuit of goal. It will affect your interpretation of happiness. So, so crisis of identity it is the major, it has been said over and over by every field of professional endeavor that one major cause of illness is crisis of identity. And that's why it's very important. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you so much for that. All right. So, Professor Lua Femi, you are in the UK, you are in London. Mm. Now, there are also a lot of Africans or African diaspora in the UK. Mm. Mm. Tell me, what do you hear people talk about the identity crisis are related to what we are talking about today. And how do you see, how do you see their life? Of course, you're an expert in this. And so how do you judge the way they behave in relation to what we are talking about so that we can actually see practical evidence of what we are seeing? Okay, um, now I'll, uh, as you know that I'm a priest, I'm an ordained priest. So I deal with church people, uh, uh, specifically, uh, the Afro-Caribbean Pentecostals. So I deal with them. Uh, I came to UK as a missionary. Now, uh, I was an ordained priest in Nigeria, so I deal with people of religious faith, okay? Now, I came here, I continue doing that. Then I changed my professional identity. I became a university lecturer, a secondary school teacher. Now, when I came in contact with our people in diaspora in the school, I began, I started noticing a mentality, a mindset. And what I noticed in that mindset, uh, with due respect, you know, with due respect, I don't want to sound derogatory. Uh, I'm being conscious of the word I'm using, but it is a sad reality that I, what I saw is inferiority complex. I'll give you a classic example. There was a time I was sharing a class with an Italian woman. We are sharing both class. When I teach on Tuesday, she comes on a Thursday. The student will go and tell her that I've not taught them. <laughs> and these are mature people. In fact, these are people, professionals. They will go and tell her, I've not taught them. So when she comes, she will ask them, oh, this topic, because we are sharing that module together. So I noticed that. They will tell them, then, the people from the Caribbean, Jamaica specifically, they came to me and they reported the Africans to me. And they said, ah, Femi, this is what these people are saying behind you. Sir, I, I was moved to tears. Why? I look at the colonial trauma in the psyche of our people in diaspora. And that colonial trauma is still there. In fact, that was one of the things that led me into therapy to study spiritual psychology. We are still suffering from that colonial trauma of inferiority complex that if it's not white, it is not right. Mm. And that is a major problem we have in diaspora. In spite of the opportunities that we have, our mentality have not changed. And you know why? Relocation does not equate transformation. You can take a man out of gutter. You can't take the ghetto out of the man. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. I really do. Of course, uh, as we move towards the ending of the program, we'll ask uh, what are some of the solutions to this. But I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Tawanda, uh, you are in the US, and of course, again, we are looking at uh, our people, the people of African descent. 
Uh, related to the same question that I asked uh, Professor Lua Femi, how do you see the effect of this crisis in the people? So that when you look at them, you say, okay, there is something need to be done. What, what kind of uh, example can you share with us? You know, I, I really appreciate what uh, Dr. Lua Femi said. And I identify with, with, with that as well. You know, uh, uh, from the angle of working in institutions, uh, academic institutions, there's a deep prejudice and implicit bias mm. that comes when you are teaching at that level mm. and how your your teaching is received or not received by students mm -hmm. there's a greater willingness to challenge you uh, as a professor when you are black <laughs> you know uh, regardless of all your degrees or all your learnings Mm -hmm. uh, some students will really want to interrogate you to say, are you sure you know what you know? Like, did you earn this degree? <laughs> you know, and it gets to the point of disrespect at, at some point. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, like was just said, you will teach something very clearly and thoroughly, and they will call, go to somebody and say, we weren't taught this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you think to yourself, what insanity is this? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and that that inferiority complex and how it radiates outward is very real. Mm. And for me, what occurred to me as part of this inferiority complex and this uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome, as somebody else has called it <laughs> in the past, uh, is people really become blind to reality. Mm. Because of that, uh, uh, how would I say, that negative self-concept mm. or that mistaken self-concept or the loss of self-concept, mm. their perception of reality itself changes. Mm. They imagine hierarchies where there are none, <laughs> right? They imagine crimes where there are none. Mm. They mistake the darkness within themselves for the blackness of another person's skin and vice versa. Really, people become blind and much more likely to follow the blind mm. when that inferiority uh, complex is there, when that self-concept is lost, mm. right? In America, for instance, people actually believe guns are the solution to violence. <laughs> now. Any child, any two-year-old will tell you that sentence doesn't make sense. How is the object that kills the solution to violence? Any two-year-old will tell you that. that that's because a two-year-old two self-concept hasn't yet been messed up with. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Indeed, these things are learned, right? People will tell you uh, that the logical foundation of economics, for instance, is supply and demand. And they say, okay, what happens when the supply runs out? Okay, there's greater demand. What happens when the demand is met? Economics won't just honestly tell you, well, now we have to manufacture demand and need. We have to create things people don't need in order to keep economics running. Mm. <laughs> right? We need to make you want to buy a new T-shirt. We need to make you want to buy a new car. We need to keep you wanting. In order that logic is so basic and fundamental. But no, we have an entire field of economics and things that runs on this flawed logic that is very unsustainable. We all buy into it, right? Mm -hmm. What's the basis of economics? Supply and demand. That doesn't make sense, yeah. <laughs> you know? Some countries will do silly things, like uh, what happened is we are doing a preemptive strike on Iran or Iraq or whatever. What's a preemptive strike? It's us shooting you because we think you're going to shoot us. What the hell, <laughs> right? We create the fancy term preemptive strike. All evidence said they were going to shoot us, so we shot them first. What is going on in this world, right? So now we absorb and internalize these minor pathological ideas into our daily lives, right? So now I need to do a preempt preemptive strike on Dr. Olao Femi. In case I fail the class, I need to tell the other teacher he didn't teach me. That's mm -hmm. a preemptive strike. <laughs> you see, mm -hmm. it's very subtle and clear, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody looks like they're absolutely okay with their life, I need to make them feel like they need something else. Mm -hmm. Supply and demand law goes on. I need to make them feel less than somehow. 
in order to keep a relationship going. So these things mutate and transform, right? Into crazinesses. And yes, it all comes from this. I love how you explained the self-concept mm. and self-regulation and their connection. I had never made that connection before. Because if you cannot regulate yourself now, you will fall prey to yeah. any will and wind and any stream mm-hmm. that comes. You are not mm-hmm. grounded mm-hmm. because your self-concept is flawed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in the U.S., uh, commodification and capitalism, uh, capitalistic materialism are very big, of course, like they are globally. Mm-hmm. But it's difficult when you see, you know, very young children now starting to want to have uh, Botox injections or surgeries, uh, plastic mm-hmm. surgeries and things of that sort, or all of this children not feeling enough if they don't have the right phone or the right fashion and so forth and what, mm-hmm. what. All of these things just help to sustain that low self-esteem, mm-hmm. that low that low self-concept, mm-hmm. right? So you remain dysregulated mm-hmm. and you outsource your power to other things. Yeah. So you have minor addictions happening always, be it substance addictions or addictions to shopping, addictions mm-hmm. to watching things. We can extend this term of what an addiction is mm-hmm. to really show that we are now conditioned towards addiction i.e. that feeling of not being enough unless something else out external is happening. Indeed, external to my spirit, to myself, my true self. Uh, And that, I think, is the big challenge there. And, of course, we see that very much happening to people in the African diaspora and so forth. And there are very legitimate reasons, of course, historically, through slavery and colonialism that has been extended. But I will also say what people don't understand is this is also happening to the colonizer and the settler. Yeah. This is a cyclical pathology, you see. Because, you see, after they say your dark skin is terrible, what happens? They start going tanning. After they say your big lips are ugly, what do they start doing? Botox injections. Right? After they run out of creative things for themselves, what do they do? They steal your music. (laughs) Right? And your hip-hop and your everything. They approach. So this this is a cyclical pathology that happens through lack of self-concept. And now the blind will follow the blind. So that's what I see as the crisis here. When you're so blinded, you can no longer see because you cannot see yourself. So you can't see. Everything becomes threatening and you start buying into this social Darwinism, this survival of the fittest Mm -hmm. scarcity nonsense. And it's hard to find joy Mm -hmm. when that happens. And I truly believe our divine purpose, you know, is is the divination of mankind, which means living in joy and peace. We have that capacity to live in joy and connection and groundedness together. But that's not possible when you cannot see yourself as part of that divine spark of creation Mm -hmm. that is purely joyful and okay and complete in itself. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Tawanda. You see, uh, you said something before also in our previous conversation that, uh, in fact, that is something that I'm explaining uh, now more because I just told you that based on your explanation and also that of uh, Oluwa Femi and, of course, uh, those of other intelligent people like you, I have even come to understand my culture more uh, because it's not like we have uh, uh, more books to read and all of that uh, because I'm not at home. Because if I were at home, I would be able to talk to more people. And also, we are suffering from identity crisis even right in my village because everything is being destroyed intentionally so that we can be confused. The confusion is intentional. So that when you are confused, you run to the person who have created the confusion. You see, yeah. for them, it is part of the program. Mm. It is only that it is hurting us. Now, in our African spirituality, this I've come to understand, having listened to uh, intelligent people like you, the real mission that we have is to continue to evolve until we become better gods. We are God. Even, I think, even in the Bible, it is said that, because, you know, if God created you, you should be like God, you know? So that the intention is to always become a better version of ourselves, the deification of, so that you can become right. ancestors, no? You know, when we were talking about it, I said, this is a higher level of understanding. 
Many people will not understand it like this. Therefore, they cannot comport to the consequence. Therefore, uh, we will always act on the preemptive. Ah, it's going to hurt me. Let me hurt him first. But if you are mature now, you will understand that. I think it is voodoo religion where it is said that the next person to you is you. The person is a mirror through which you can see yourself. This again is an advanced way of understanding. Because now, it means the other person is you. All of us are one. Why would you hurt yourself? Why would you take a gun and shoot the other person? Like shooting yourself. Why would you do that? It means if you are shooting somebody in front of you, you are shooting at a mirror. Only that the object projected in the mirror is you. If you want to be good, do good to the other people. God will not just appear to you so that you say, oh, God, I am a good person. No, if you want to do something good to God, do it to the person. Because the other person is your God. Because all of you are God. That is why in African tradition, in African spirituality, when somebody dies and this person is a good person, we pray through the person. A man in my, in my town, where I'm coming from, I've written at least up to like four or five articles about him. His name is Agbanoji, the second king of Urumi. After he's dead, because of what happened, the Urumi army defied him. He is worshipped today as God. But now, the concept of personhood. Understanding that, having a good understanding, how would that affect our relationships as human beings? Let me understand that. Mm -hmm. For me, it's... Uh... Going back to the idea of self-concept, I think when you have a, a healthier uh, sense of what a person is, that just means you have a stronger self-concept, <laughs> right? But also your conception of reality itself shifts greatly when you have that deep grounding in a holistic sense of self that extends beyond or that transcends the material it joins the material and the spiritual and so forth. When that happens, your sight just becomes clearer. You will no longer be fooled by people who burn down libraries and then call the people uneducated, right? Mm -hmm. People who make people work 16 hours a day and then call them lazy while they're beating them, right? People who steal people's children and, and rape women and so forth and then call the other person savages all of these lies that the world throws at you or oh, those are all examples from colonialism and slavery by the way in case you missed it right white people doing these things and then pointing the finger at black people right black people are violent so let's shoot them right uh, they're savages so let's let's breed them like animals right and treat their women however we want and call them savage all of these lies, paradoxes, hypocrisies will fall away. Your seeing will just become clear, right? It may similar to, be similar to what the Buddhists uh, refer to as enlightenment. A very simple idea of reality becomes clear. You start to see things as they are, and then you begin to behave accordingly, according to the highest good. It is kind of that simple, right? I will not cut a flower unnecessarily unless it's serving a higher purpose. Indeed, I'd rather buy a plant than a flower, <laughs> right, for my house. I might start to eat less meat because I know of the pollution it causes. I'm not saying you become vegetarian all of a sudden, but you just become more conscious of what you consume, right? When I feel connected to people, I will tell them I care about them and that they're important any chance I get. I will always try to be an agent of good rather than an agent of discouragement. When people are gossiping, I will feel no need to boost my own inferiority or my own morale by putting someone else down. Mm -hmm. When I make a mistake, I will say, I'm sorry, how do I fix it? Yes, I will feel no need egotistically to hide behind something else or make excuses. If I wake up late to my job, I won't try to make an excuse. My car tire, my water, I just miss my alarm, boss. What can I do? <laughs> and I keep moving. With integrity and honesty, life simply becomes kinder and simple. When people think of, you know, sometimes uh, what heaven will look like and things of that sort, I sometimes think heaven, 
if it was on earth, it wouldn't look very different from the world it is right now. But you'd wake up feeling less fearful. You'd wake up feeling less defensive. You could say hello to your neighbor. And so we will simply walk together towards solutions that make sense for us all, right? We're not looking to break down society and reality. When I have a full understanding of myself as a person, I have love for all of humankind. I lose judgment. I become truly connected. And again, I see very clearly what is happening. I don't even need to go to school <laughs> to see clearly. I'm just talking about seeing reality for what it is, not book learning. You will notice lies, you will notice unkindness. You will see murder and you will call it murder. You will see injustice and you will want to fix it, but you will see it very clearly without all the additional fanciness and flares. And when you sit quietly by yourself, you will feel connected to spirit and to the divine. And you will feel connected to that as it manifests in everyone else as well. That is where we want to be. That is the kind of world we want to be. We are, we are conscious of our lives. Because even for those uh, that are religious, uh, those that pray every day, they must understand that if somebody has sat down and put all this together, the person will be conscious of what he's doing. So that we can't just be living haphazardly and trying to dash everything out there, thinking that that is going to fix it. No, we, we really need to be conscious. So a couple of years ago, I interviewed the Nigerian ambassador to Italy. Uh, we, he, we organized an event where he came to the city where I am, I am in Verona. So I was asking him, why is it that uh, Nigeria, we can't even fix our main problem? Because what happens in Nigeria is that we have this politician who create their own problem and they want us to solve the problem that they have created, but they leave the real problem that the people will look, will find a solution to. They don't touch that. <laughs> like for example, okay, you're not from Nigeria, maybe you might not know, but this is what is happening in Nigeria. In May 1999, that was when Nigeria returned to democracy after a long period of, of uh, military dictatorship. At that time, see now, the problem that were there are still there. Like, for example, that the infrastructure in Nigeria are still dilapidating. We need to fix them. They knew this. The politicians in Nigeria knew this. That, for example, Nigeria is not generating enough electricity to power the, the economy. They knew that the people were already complaining about this as of May 1999. Instead, when they came, they start creating problems for themselves, blaming themselves. For example, they decided to create Boko Haram. That time, there was no Boko Haram. That was a problem that was created by them. They want to resolve it. They can't even fix it because it become part of their administrative agenda to say that we are solving this problem. But did we not say we wanted to solve that problem like road, like education, like light? The lie that Nigeria as a country is generating is less than what a small state in any country in the West will generate. And we want to power the entire economy. But how do you do that? <laughs> I, I identify with that a lot because that, that's, uh, you know, similar in Zimbabwe and in other places. Uh, that's when we, when we talk about that internalized inferiority complex. It's gone so deep that people do not even believe that they deserve good things and happiness, mm -hmm. you see? So if you show up and you start talking about clean water and roads and whatnot, you know, in Zimbabwe, somebody say, oh, you've been influenced by America. This isn't America. It's not the West, you know. <laughs> and they start, rather than talking about the issue, they'll start, you know, diverting, you know, pointing in every other direction, but the fact that you need to fix this pothole in the road. <laughs> you see, it's a simple thing. But, and then to create a movement around that, people's internalized inferiority is now so deep that right. people cannot gather around giving themselves clean water, right? Fixing a road, educating their children, all of these very basic things. Again, right? When your sense of personhood is so clear, you, you start to see all of these hypocrisies and lies for what they are. And you realize that a very poor self concept right, is a big part of it, that people can only think they can be wealthy if they steal or if somebody else is not getting something, mm. right? People will only, think, will, will only will stop thinking that when you offer a good thing, 
it's not because you want personal gain. Sometimes people really just want everyone to have a road at education, right? They're not trying to get something over you and so forth, right? You lose that paranoia as well, indeed. So it's like very simple in that way. And yes, there are many patterns around the world that we see that are very much like this. Even the politics in America currently is very confused because of all of these paranoias and fears, right? And people yelling accusations and splitting sides and so forth. And it's like, no, we can all pause and ask the question. This is why I got interested in personal. Uh, because after all of this education and learning and so forth, I just had to pause for a moment and say, what is a person? Because the way the world is going, we seem not to have agreed on a simple thing, which is what a person is, right? We have too many different ideas of what a person is. Some people say, if you're an immigrant, you're not a person. If you're rich, you're not a person. If you're poor, you're not a person. If you're straight, you're not a person. If you're queer, you're not a person, right? If you're religious, you're not a person. If you're uh, atheist, you're not a person. And I say, no, you know, we can't go anywhere as a globe if we can't even agree on what a person is, <laughs> right? Because that's why colonialism and slavery occurred. Some people thought other people were not people and mm -hmm. they could do whatever they wanted, right? And it's very recently that some people, you know, got the right to be a person, <laughs> you know, and so forth. And if we can't even agree on that, then what the hell are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing, right? And how can I know who I am when I, we can't even agree on what a person is <laughs> in this way? And it has to start somewhere. It has to start somewhere. And these honest conversations, Sadly, it seems that the simpler the conversation is, the more challenging it is to have. Because go up to any, you know, stereotypical politician who is corrupt anywhere in the world and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about what a person is. Oh, my God, you might end up in jail in Zimbabwe. And be, what are you trying to say? <laughs> is that I don't know what a person is? You're trying to cause trouble. Is this, are you a revolutionary? <laughs> They'll send you to jail. You cannot even have simple conversations anymore. Right? Unless you're going to school, to academia, to take these deep classes, that's where you can now have conversations. But we need to have these conversations everywhere, all the time, you know? But we can't. Uh, and that's a real big problem. What, what are our priorities, you know? So now I have to ask myself, how do I choose my friends? You know, that's why I talk to people like you, because these are the conversations I need to be having, <laughs> right? It's, it gets harder and harder to have meaningless conversations when you're really trying to find a way towards personhood, right? So you don't buy into this global identity crisis that everyone, not just black people, are suffering from. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. All right, uh, for, for, for Professor Lua Femi, I, I like to understand, okay, now we are talking about the solution because the, the image that is painted by the Dr. Tawanda is really beautiful. And I, if I really close my eyes, I can even see that is a possibility if we were to work towards it. Because nature really is not lacking the potential to sustain life. It is we that is just hurting ourselves. And even when we come to nature ecology and all of it, I say, it's not like we are trying to help nature. We are helping ourselves to be alive. Because if we trouble nature that much, what it just needed to change few code will be wiped out from existence. Nature will still be here. We must understand depends on something other than just us. Anyway, anyway, I don't want to drive that that much. Uh, so, Professor Eloa Fabi, uh, give us a picture. What should we do? What is your solution for us to be able to retrace our step back from this identity crisis? What do you suggest? Uh, I mean, thank you. Uh, um, you can see uh, from um, my little uh, you know, discourse, uh, any ontology that is built on materialism, that is the problem. Mm -hmm. our, our ontology is built, the, the dominant ontology, both Africa, this is about humanity, sir. it's not just about African people. Even the most religious, now we are suffering from religious materialism or spiritual materialism now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so you can see that. So until humanity comes back to the ontological crisis that we are not material, I came to this world with nothing, I will live with nothing. That's it. Mm. You came here with nothing, you will live with nothing. Then why do you want to kill yourself by the material accumulation of things? And mm -hmm. because our sense of self is defined, our self-esteem, our sense of self-worth 
is all materialistic determined. So the criteria, just like what uh, Dr. Tawada was saying, who is a person? If you are not rich, if you are not, if you don't go to this school, you are not a person. They don't see you as a person because you don't, you don't have uh, American asset, you don't have the British asset, or you do You see, all everything, all the criteria, even for definition of personhood, is based on materialistic ontology. Mm. So mm. And until we deviate from that, to our understanding that. I'm a spirit, I exist beyond time and space. And in mm. transpersonal theory, and that's what we call this identification. So you are disidentifying yourself from the ego self. That the fact that I have millions in my account does not mean the person that is high on in my shirt should not be valued. Because mm. when cancer comes, your million will not save you. Mm. That things <laughs> money cannot buy. That's mm. why you see in the United Nations and what an organization said by 2030, the number one health condition in both developing world and developed world is, is depression. And that is coming from a materialistic materialist ontology because material things and accumulation of material things will never fill the spiritual void in the soul of a man. Yeah. And that's why you can have millions in the bank. You, you can commit suicide. You can have millions in the bank and be depressed. Don't you see how depression is on the increase? The pressure, yeah. the pressure will continue to be on the increase because of materialistic view of life. Yes. And the attachment to a materialist ontology. And that is the problem. Your money, your bank account, your certificate does not define you. It doesn't mm. define you. You can have all these qualifications and everything, and you are still depressed. Why? You have not found the sense of meaning and purpose. And that sense of meaning and purpose that gives true joy, not happiness now, joy that comes with, within your spirit, that is your authentic self, that comes mm. with your spiritual self. And that's what gives you joy, a sense of fulfillment that I've discovered the reason for my existence. And that will give mundane things meaning. That's it. It is purpose. And that is only found in your spiritual identity, not in my material identity thank you mm. thank you wow. so much for that that is beautiful that is, that is wonderful that is wonderful i want to clap my hands now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank that's you sir exactly fantastic and pointing out that this problem of materialism mm. uh it runs very deep it's, it's mm. now a part of many people's self-concept yeah <laughs> hence i like that you bring up the depression in things right yeah. but yeah. this valuing yourself through things that are outside of yourself Yes. It's a sincerely big problem, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. now you end up living through comparison and competition. Thank you. Right? Thank you. So when, you, and this happens, you know, I, I, I noticed for myself a few years ago that something's afoot because, you know, at the beginning of the month, I'm very happy. As the month gets closer to the end, <laughs> I get happy. And then I started to see the correlation between the numbers in my bank account. And I exactly. said, this isn't right. I can't, I can't, I can't have my mood changing based on you know how much money is in my bank, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And even so, I wasn't anywhere near poverty, you know, but mm -hmm. just the numbers itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somehow, I carried that in my consciousness, and my, my self worth mm. was fluctuating mm. based on that. Thank you, thank right? you. I look at somebody else's car and say, ah, why don't I have a car like that? I don't even like cars like that, but I know it's an expensive one, and mm -hmm. I'm already compared myself mm -hmm. right so constantly living in comparison and people internalize this materialism to such an extent mm -hmm. uh if you don't mind my saying even even religiously now people assume yeah. that you are more moral if you have more money yeah because yeah. god is giving you blessings exactly right? yeah. you are mm -hmm. blessed mm -hmm. by god mm -hmm. we can tell because you're rich so that means yeah. you're a good person yeah. my yeah. god what stupidity mm -hmm. right and we, we keep quoting the New Testament and so forth, but at the end of the day, we've internalized this idea yeah, that yeah. God is going to show you he loves you by giving you things, mm, right? Mm. After everything we know about Jesus' life and everything, what stupidity. And mm, we internalize mm, And we go to the big, fancy, wealthy churches and say, yes, I've been blessed. Every we dance, we lose our minds. Say, yes, I'm so blessed. And exactly. say, yes, God loves you. Why? Because he gave you a car? Mm -hmm. No economics gave you a car, you idiot. Go and love your brother like what's written in the book. <laughs> you know, what is this? But we internalize it so much. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I just wanted to reiterate what Dr. Olafemi said, which is really, really essential. You, you know, I don't found that. What I found that, uh, it, it will shock you. <laughs> I mean, like I said to you, I'm a priest. Hmm. Uh, I've been dealing all my life with touch people. I was hmm. born into the church. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I see that every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. And then there was a time I like, what is wrong? Then I now look at the theology we are fed in Africa. It was based on need. You yes. So because yeah. we are struggling with the need, if you look at the master hierarchy of need, so we are at the bottom left, food, clothing, and shelter. So there's poverty. Now, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that gospel, but the danger of that gospel is that it leads to consumer mentality. Yes. 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 That's what you were saying. So it feeds us into a consumer mentality that all we want to do, we want to consume, we want to buy things because we want to show off. Mm -hmm. If I tell you, sir, the amount of people in the church when they come to Sunday service and they tell me what they want to show off, it will shock yes. you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <indeed. laughs> that they just want to show off. And then you will now sit down, you will now look at it, that... Mm -hmm. Is that really cost? And then the material prosperity gospel mm. has done a great damage in our Afro-Caribbean community. You know, and what 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 did the philosophy of Yeshua Mashiach? It said a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Yes. <laughs> so my life is not determined by my material possession. However, it doesn't say we should not enjoy material comfort, but mm. he said, don't define your life by your material possession. Exactly. Because exactly. I keep on saying, when sickness comes, sir, you will forget about the material. Very true. Very true. You, you know, and then you now look at the people that are supposedly call themselves the low God, and then you now see them that are the even the one that is worse when it comes to materialism. Yes. So what did I find out in my research? It is this theology we are fed. We are fed a materialistic theology. So you yes. now see that the rate of depression in the secular world and in the church world is the same. Christians yes. are committing suicide. Yeah. Christians are becoming more depressed. And yes. that is what I'm saying to them, that we need to go back into our theology and see what we are being fed. Because... Yes. This day and end, the whole world is going to crisis of identity, and depression is the is the outcome of a materialistic ontology. Thank you. Yes, yes. Oh, Thank I love so that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much mm -hmm. for that, sir. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All You're right. Welcome. So, yeah, I also ask you the same question, Doctor Tawanda. Uh, what is the solution? Because now we've talked about um, identity crisis as it relates to African and African diaspora. Uh, people are waiting for the solution. Okay, they've heard uh, from Professor Oluwa for me. So they also want to hear what is your, what do you recommend as a way to come out of this, uh, I call it quagmire, because now we are confused and we become object for other people to run and use as they like. So how can we refine ourselves? How can we find ourselves back? Maybe re remember, I think that is the word you use there. Remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with everything that that's been said uh, so so perfectly well by Dr. Olafim. Uh, and, it, you know, ju just to deepen that, because I don't think I, I can add anything new to it, but just to deepen this idea of remembering, mm -hmm. uh, you need to pause, you know, to find time to pause, to contemplate, to meditate, to pray, whatever that brings you that quiet mm -hmm. that can then create space for clarity in how you see the world mm -hmm. is very, very important. And I would suggest part of remembering just requires just start noticing things. Mm. Just start noticing things that seem wrong with the world or suspicious about the world. Mm -hmm. Things that don't feel right in your spirit. Things that do not edify your soul, <laughs> as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think part of the joy of being human and being conscious is we have spiritual intuition as well. Yes, yes. If we are quiet enough to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And this requires very much, again, acknowledging the depth of materialism and turning away from it. 
as was said. If you saw the diagram that, that I began with, it began with that interconnection of spirit and matter. matter. Mm -hmm. If you cannot understand that, uh, that that is the, the, the reality, and that actually spirit and matter are not separate. Everything, including matter, is just spirit manifesting. Yes. <laughs> you see? If you can live in that deeply spiritual reality and to mm -hmm. start to see it and experience it as reality, very quickly you'll start to lose faith in the world of materialism. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it shows for itself how unsustainable ah. it is. Mm -hmm. It shows itself every day how unsustainable it is. Mm. When I find that quiet, that allows for spiritual intuition, again, self-knowledge is the highest form of knowledge. I can then look at myself, my behavior, my beliefs, and so forth, right? I like that idea of, uh, you know, uh, a theology of materialism, right? Mm. I can, I can ask myself questions, right? Like when I said, if I notice my mood changing based on my bank account, so it goes. Or if I'm driving down the street and I see a homeless or unhoused person on the side of the road and I have to decide whether or not to give them a dollar, I need to notice those split-second decisions in my mind. That part of my mind that says they're probably poor because they're bad or they did something wrong, right, with their life. We all see that. Well, when it happens, just very so that little judgment, what's happening there is just like me judging myself based on how much money is my account, my morality, mm. right? Mm -hmm. A little split second there, I say they are poor because they did something wrong, God is punishing them, or they are mm. paying for this. Already mm. I put judgment on that. That's how deep this goes. In very mm. subtle decisions I make every day, mm -hmm. right? Try to give a homeless person a dollar and not even worry about what they'll spend it on. That's not up to me. They mm -hmm. want to, I give them a dollar. I don't care if it's going to drugs or alcohol. I don't know them, <laughs> right? Can I do that? Can I start to separate myself from this materialistic world? Mm -hmm. Can I still trust in the fact that I will do my work and I will trust the divine with the outcome and the result? Yes, yes, yes. Right? Can I just show love and not mm -hmm. expect something in return? So when I start to change myself, because of this model of personhood that I'm working with, where you are a part of the cosmos and the cosmos, you, when I am changing myself, I am changing the world. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to happen, I need to create that quiet that helps me start to see more clearly. Mm. And it doesn't have to be the literal quiet. It can be that too. But quiet also happens when you're in good conversations like this. When you, when you start to notice, oh, I'm thinking more clearly and new thoughts are happening. Right? That's a form of quiet as well. Can I create more of these contexts for quiet mm. that allows space for that spirit to start working through me, to start being alive again? It's mm. like watering that seed, right? Watering the spirit. The spirit is always there, but yeah. it gets very yeah. compressed and small and so forth. So mm -hmm. I need to start <laughs> cultivating it like a garden once again, watering it, mm. making that flame start to grow brighter as it is. But really, uh, yeah, just uh, trying to enrich what was already said, that recognition of this materialistic foundation of things, which then leads to scarcity and fear and doubt and self-doubt, it's a very clear chain. We need to start finding ways to turn away from that. And like I always like to say, I find the others. <laughs> start finding others who think like you, not who think exactly like you, people who ask the same questions like you, who help you grow your mind, find the others who are looking for positive solutions mm -hmm. to the world. And you'll find them in unlikely places. You'll find them in different belief systems, in different mm -hmm. political parties, different socioeconomic classes. But start to notice, start to find the others, people who are asking the difficult questions and trying to live that very positive and honest life of integrity as a person among persons. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Now, um, for people that want to uh, connect with you, what is the best way to reach out to you who want to learn more? This is important also for us because we're also here to connect, like you, of course, already pointed out. Well, for me, uh, I think I, I think at the end of my slides, I put my information there. But people can feel free to uh, email me. I think if you have the email, Obey, you can share that. And also, you can find me on uh, Instagram, Tawanda Creative, 
uh, one word. And I'm very happy to have conversations there on social media as well, but always very open and happy uh, to continue deepening and sharing in these conversations. Thank you so much for that. So what would be your final thought briefly to conclude this conversation on identity crisis? How do you conclude it? The message, at least that I tell my students and hope they hear every day uh, in school, I start every semester with this because I also teach uh, at a, in a border region where identity is very important uh, by the border of Mexico and America and so forth. Um, but I always begin by telling people that no matter who you are, where you're from, your skin color, your gender, race, etc., you belong. You belong to this cosmos, you belong to this world, you are loved. You are born of something divine, something much greater and mysterious than any of us can understand. And, is it, and it is up to you to choose your purpose. Wherever you walk, in moments of doubt and discomfort and so forth, I hope that's all you can remember that you belong, you are not an accident, and you are not a mistake. And within you, you have the capacity, you have everything you need to achieve everything you choose to for the greater good. So my last message is basically that. That is why I talk about personhood in an age where everything is designed to make you doubt yourself mm. and depend on other things. Know that you belong and you are capable. And as you are created, you are created with everything you need to make it through. Thank you so much for that. That is powerful and also uplifting and liberating for many people. I appreciate that. All right. So, Professor Luwa Femi, uh, thank you so much for, for your sharing also. So, um, for people that want to connect with you, I want to learn more about you. How can they find you? Please share with them. Thank you. Uh, we, I mean, we are there, airwaylondonuniversity.org. Um, we have courses that we offer. We are an indigenous university, as you know, uh, that we are very uh, indigenous in the sense that our curriculum is based on the philosophy of indigenous psychology, also emancipatory concept of higher education and transpersonal education philosophy. So we are there, and then you can, you know, you can, you can, you can contact us on our website. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All right. So in approaching uh, identity crisis today, you use uh, the transpersonal psychology uh, as an explanation, helping people to understand uh, what this term is. So how would you conclude it? What is your final thought here to conclude the conversation? Maybe a final message you can leave with the people. Yeah, I mean, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for bringing uh, Dr. Tawanda and for his uh, wisdom and his concept. So uh, the final conclusion, who are we? We are spirit. <laughs> Man is a spirit. He, he has a soul. He lives in the body. And according to transpersonal philosophy, we exist beyond time and space. Therefore, we are spiritual beings trying to have a physical experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You see, that is very powerful, though, in that when you tell people that they exist beyond time and space, you free them. You are free. That it's like you can really fly because you are no longer confined to uh, just an ideology that, okay, you are just this and that's all. No, you are now free. And like the, the, uh, Tawanda was also saying, now that you know that you are part of it, what do you do? Now you are free. You are just free as a human being. So experience life as a free human being. You are not in prison. No man can put you in prison. No man can threaten you because you have been part of eternity and you will be for eternity. How powerful is that for you? That you are from eternity and you will be here for eternity. Of course, maybe not in this form, but because you are not just this form, you are a spirit. Your spirit lives forever. That is so liberating. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for both mm -hmm. of you. I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>